Now, uh, as we have um, learned from this morning's talks, and as I'm sure you've known already, the conventional wisdom is that PEHs are uh, likely candidates for infrared emission bands and uh, diffuse interstellar bands. But, um, and all, and they, they, they are the so-called missing link, which will connect the small carbon structures to the large carbon particles. But I don't think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm correct in this statement, right? That no specific interstellar identification of a pH line has been made. Okay. Uh, so this morning I've seen a lot of PAHs on, on, uh, on, on, on vibrational lines, but none of them uh, is obvious which PAH. But actually I do not, what I'd like to also understand from this meeting, because I'm not a, 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 a complete expert, certainly an expert in this area, is, is how do you say that it's a PAH? But precursor PAH has been found in Murchison and Alande meteorites, yeah, and that's of course naphtali. That was done in, 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 in a work which Dick Zare did uh, some 10 years ago, where they took, in fact, the samples from the National Meteorite Collection in the, in the Smithsonian, and, 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 and uh, this is a mass spectroscopy. This is a very fancy mu L squared MS, means the micro uh, laser desorption, laser ionization mass spectroscopy. And they found uh, 128, which is uh, naphtaline, several uh, lines. I think this is the Alande meteorite, and this is Mercutian uh, uh, meteorite, suggesting that uh, there is an in interstellar origin to PEHs. Now, uh, formation of naphtaline, which is what uh, I, I, I will partly talk about, can be thought of as, as, as a talk this morning from a reaction between phenyl and vinyl acetylene. C, C6H5 and C4H4 combining to give you naphtaline and a hydrogen atom, which is this. So going from here to here through a, what is so-called re barrierless reaction, this blue line to, to, to the products. Uh, and that has been sort of connected to formation of PEHs in, in cold molecular clouds at, at low temperatures. There's another way to form naphtaline, and that's taking benzene and obenzene. You start with two rings, and you let uh, them react to form uh, naphtaline and acetylene, C2H2. And the reaction goes through a barrier now uh, from here to here, the naphtaline and acetylene C. This uh, was just very recently um, calculated, DFT type calculation, in, in, in a paper in physical chemistry. Yeah. But the, what is, uh, I, I think is really uh, a major step forward is that you can actually create pure carbon stuff. Okay? No hydrogen atoms, no oxygen. And that, of course, is the seminal detection of uh, um, C60 and C70 in a young planetary nebula that Yen uh, Kami spoke uh, this morning. And these are the, the four vibrational lines which are uh, at least uh, somewhat conclusively been attached to the C C60 uh, vibrational modes of uh, Vibrational modes of C60. Now, the conclusion uh, was that no PEHs were found, and I think this is still true, if I understand correctly, somewhat, that because it's a, it's a hydrogen, it's, this planetary nebula is a hydrogen, has a hydrogen poor environment. And also the temperatures are low. It's about 300 degrees room, te room temperature. Now, uh, we know that the a large uh, budget of, uh, I'm sorry, large fraction of the total carbon budget in the universe is, is found either uh, PAHs or in some uh, graphitic form, uh, such as graphites and perhaps nanotubes and other structures and, and, and uh, buggy balls. Now, one 
a major uh, line in, 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 in astronomy or outstanding challenge in astronomy is the so-called 21 centimeter restriction bump, which, is, uh, which exists. And of course, its, its origin is still not quite understood. But uh, there are uh, speculations that this line could be due to some graphitic form of carbon compound. Now, uh, this experiment uh, of a plasma and a spectroscopy of, of, of graphene and through a single layer, multi-layer, multi all the way to 10 layers, which essentially exhibits bulk behavior in graphite by the same people who won the Nobel Prize two years ago for the discovery of graphene, um, shows the, gives this bump, which is, pro which is almost precisely at the 2175 angstrom. So, but of course, this is probably not conclusive enough evidence to suggest that this is due only to graphene. We don't have graphene in, in natural form. We have to pull it with a scotch tape. Um, but graphite, of course, exists in, in, in a natural form. Um, now, there are two, go two ways uh, to go about discussing the formation of these sort of uh, carbon structures. And, and that, again, also has been discussed by uh, Oliver this morning. One would be the bottom-up approach. You start with, uh, let's say, C2 bonds and CH bonds. You start building uh, more complex networks uh, and, and, and go through the spontaneous isomerization to rings. And finally, some uh, high temperature events will happen and you get carbon cages okay, or PAHs. The top down would be you start with PAHs, which uh, exist, okay, and then uh, I'm trying to understand how this thing works. This is isomerization and this is dehydrogenation. So you start uh, pulling hydrogens by, uh, by, by UV photons, which uh, are given to you by God, um, and then uh, uh, and dehydrogenate, and, and finally you form carbon cages. But this time, you could do so at low temperatures, because you don't need uh, the, 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 the kinetic energy to to go through this process. Okay. Both of these could be valid. But all of these uh, methods so far, as far as I can uh, understand, require that you have thermodynamic equilibrium to arrive at. Uh, so you do a static um, calculations. Of course, the experiments do dynamics. But you do a static uh, simulation, and, and, and you calculate the rates for certain processes to occur. But of course, growth is always non-equilibrium. Okay? There is no a process in, in, uh, which gives you growth that goes uh, directly from an equilibrium condition to a final equilibrium condition. So can we understand the kinetics and time scales for formation? Okay? Now, high, high temperature dynamics are, can become straightforward to interpret because you can have over the barrier reactions and, and, and so have you. But ISM is cold. Okay, the temperatures are you know, tens of Kelvin to 100 Kelvin. Can we do dynamics at low temperature? Okay. So we started thinking about doing uh, molecular dynamic simulation at, at r relatively low, low temperatures, certainly not at 10 Kelvin. Okay. But I will show you uh, maybe some predictive mechanism for trying to sort of uh, get, get to those low temperatures as well. So uh, we, we, uh, we started with reactive molecular dynamics simulations. Now, we wanted to do self-assembly. So we start with, uh, let's say, some C2 bonds and CH bonds, and, and, and you let them dance okay, in a box. Okay. Give them some uh, initial temperature okay, and, and let them evolve. So we started with, with, with the range of densities. Now, these are not clearly not astrophysical, I mean, molecular clouds densities. There can be astrophysical densities, but not molecular clouds densities. Okay. Certainly atomic densities. Right? But we sort of uh, span about four orders, roughly all four orders of magnitude in densities in, in, in trying to uh, look at the process of formation. 
And we also did, uh, as I said, uh, carbon-hydrogen and several different densities for both uh, carbon and hydrogen with different ratios, actually. It's not, they're not exactly the same. You need one ratio, one, one, and two, one. Um, and, and we use both empirical and quantum uh, intermolecular potentials for self-assembly uh, calculations to speed things up because doing uh, quantum uh, potential calculations can be quite uh, time and, and manpower consuming. Empirical calculations assume that the total energy is this, is this bond order energy, uh, which is given down here, which has two, two terms, one term which is a repulsive interactions, just like this, it's an exponential, as an attractive uh, term, which is also uh, given here, and, and, and with some bond order, again, which sort of switches between the different, uh, different, uh, different bonds, uh, sigma and pi bonds in, in the molecule. Then there's also a Leonard-Jones potentials. For those of you who may not know, Leonard-Jones is essentially like a van der Waals type uh, interaction, okay, C6 and C4, C12. And then some torsional potential in, in the problem. So we use this sort of uh, energies or potential to be able to do calculations and, and look at the, the the temperature dependence, the density dependence for, uh, for different uh, processes. So, for instance, at 500 Kelvin, that's the lowest temperature. I mean, we've gone down to about 300 degrees, but not lower. But, um, but at 500 degrees, uh, what we would find is that after about 50 nanoseconds, you would get long chains of these. Every dot is a carbon atom, so you get long chains. Okay. You, you, in about 100 nanoseconds, you begin to form rings, but of course, these would not be like five-member five rings or six-member rings. These are many particle rings. And at 200 uh, nanoseconds, you get more of a sort of a planar structure. At 1,000 degrees, okay, you, you also form these planar structures at 50 nanoseconds. At 100 nanoseconds, you begin to see some amount of curvature because... Uh, you form uh, different uh, you know, sort of defects in, in the system. And a 200 nanosecond is, uh, again, whatever you want to call it, is some sort of a uh, cluster. Is that hydrogen? No, no, these are carbon. Pure carbon. This, this is right now carbon. Yeah. Pure carbon. Yeah. So you jack up the temperature at 2,000 degrees. Uh, now you're beginning to see uh, the emergence of five-member and six-member rings. Because there's enough kinetic energy in the system to be able to fuse. Okay. So you form what looks like a mm, tubular um, uh, structure. And at 3,000 degrees, you're now seeing th these, these hexagons and pentagons form, which then gives you uh, essentially a, a fullerene type uh, system. It is imperf imperfect because, I mean, we, we just following it up to about 50 nanoseconds and truncating it at this type of densities and, and this size of a box. So it's, it's, it's 50 nanometers on each side. Now, what we could do is that, say, look for a particular um, a structure, in this case, a structure of a, of a, of a, of a chain, okay? and say um, <clears throat> how long it would take Okay, computational time at different temperatures to form it. Okay. So look for at different temperatures for a typical structure like this, and we've done this for others, such as uh, graphene flakes and, and so on, and you get a, a sort of a power law dependence. In this case, it's roughly 1 over temperature. So that sort of gives you a predictive power. If you go down to 10 degrees, how long it would take for such a structure to form. If you also looked at the dependence with particle density, now the density, we did several, and I'm showing only two, well, I'm only in, in, in words, that is, uh, at uh, about 10 to the minus 7 angstrom, 1 over angstrom cube. Uh, in order to convert that to 1 over a centimeter cube, you know what to do, right? You multiply by 10 to the 24. <laughs> okay. So 
only short change molecules form after about 100 nanoseconds. And fullerenes appear. I mean, we did these sort of simulations that took up to very long time. The long here means several microseconds, okay. which uh, in computational time is enormous. Okay. Given that the time scales, sorry, the, the time uh, mesh size that we were using were about 0.1 femtoseconds. And fullerenes appear after about one microsecond in this case. At this density, you lower the density, and only short change molecules, short change meaning uh, molecules with car carbon number of carbon atoms about 10 or less, after about a half a microsecond. So, so if you lower the density, then uh, you almost never get to, to, to cages and, and, and clusters. Now, this is the point uh, about hydrogenation. So if you now include hydrogen bonds okay, at several different temperatures, now the density here, hmm, I forgot to write. I think I had it over here. Yeah, about 10 to the mi 2 times 10 to the minus 6. Then, <clears throat> again, uh, um, uh, so you form these unsaturated carbon-hydrogen chain molecules at 500 degrees. It's your only chained molecules are formed. And as you increase the temperature, you begin to see the formation of the, the curvature and the cluster. Okay. But nevertheless, uh, all of the, the hydrogen atoms terminate the growth of large carbon structures. Okay. So, so this, this was referring to maybe the question you now, in order to sort of simulate astrophysical conditions, what we thought that perhaps what we could do is sort of manually inject carbon atom into the, into the simulation. So we started with a fixed number because a spontaneous folding becomes, at lower temperatures, becomes less and less efficient when the steady state conditions uh, are considered. So we include a flow of carbon material, hoping to be able to see facilitate new equilibria and eventually to, car to, to curve the structures. So we started with 100 carbon atoms. I mean, this temperature, I think the student chose it, but it's a sort of an arbitrary temperature. We could choose 1,000 Kelvin. We could choose 500 Kelvin. And, 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 and such a density. And, and, and this was just a sort of a model study to see what, what would happen. And equilibrate for 10 nanoseconds, okay, and then add an influx of atom, carbon atoms. You just inject it and use that as an, as an initial condition to move on for another, say, 10 nanoseconds, but while keeping the box size fixed, therefore increasing the density. So this is what we, we would find. If you start with 100 carbon atoms, at about 10 nanoseconds, you form this. The temperature is, as I said, it's uh, one, uh, close to 2,000 degrees Kelvin. And you would form these... Uh, Many, many, many carbon rings, okay? including sometimes maybe hexagons and, and, in this case, pentagons too, so irregularly shaped rings. Uh, at about 20 nanoseconds, you would begin to see now uh, curvature. Now, where, where you see the lines which are missing, the carbon bonds missing, is not because they're, actually they're not connected to each other, it's because these are periodic boundary conditions and you have, so some of these carbon atoms actually belong to the next box. But of course, it's, it's periodic, which means that the structure is the same. So you could sort of have to sort of, uh, and, and when you do it in these visualization package, it doesn't tend to connect the, the lines. But you begin to see the curvature. Okay? So the idea was this, to, to be able to, to inject carbon atoms and see whether curvature could, could happen. Now. You go, to, you go here, and after 10 nanoseconds, so this is after 10 nanoseconds, you stop, you add 20 carbon atoms, okay, and you, um, you process, you equilibrate for another 10 nanoseconds. Okay? So now you'll be comparing these two. This one with 120 atoms, and this one with 100 atoms. And then you stop, you add another 20 atoms, run for another 100, 10 nanoseconds, you can continue this process, and this is... With 140 atoms, this is with um, 
100 atoms at the same time. And you begin to see that there is a lot more curvature and a lot more regularity here than existed in the previous one. Okay. We also did size distribution, uh, uh, if you call it measurement. Uh, so what we took was that um, we took about 4,000 atoms, carbon atoms, and simulated it, and also took 10,000 atoms and simulated it. Here the temperature was 500 degrees Kelvin. And we stopped after 200 nanoseconds, arbitrarily, and asked, took a snapshot and said, what sort of clusters do we find? Say I'm going to look for clusters of, uh, of roughly this shape, this number of carbon atoms, and bin them. Uh, the bin size is 25 carbon atoms. Okay? So here you have, in other words, this stick gives you the probability that you have 25 carbon atoms. This one has 50 carbon atoms, 75, and so on and so on. So structures which look like this, but successively have more and more carbon atoms. Okay. The simulations are this green thing, sticks, and over here too. Now this is the temp uh, uh, same temperature, but 10,000 atoms, a lot more atoms, more than a factor of two atoms. And, and the greens ones are the distribution of the clusters that form. And, 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 and the, hmm, this would be what, uh, not pur purple, I suppose, or blue, uh, is the gamma distribution. So more or less, there is a gamma distribution. It's not quite Poissonian, but it is a gamma distribution of, of, uh, of, of, of different, different, different clusters which form in, in, in this process. Uh, we can continue. We can go to uh, a, a, a thousand Kelvin, so we don't have to really follow it uh, all that long. So about a hundred nanosecond or so, and and do uh, do the same sort of a measurement, okay. and look at the distribution as a function of the number of carbon atoms, and find that uh, also fit more or less the gamma distribution, uh, and and uh, with with these number of initial number of atoms for 4,100 and, and, and 10,000 carbon atoms. They're all carbon. Now, so the one take home message from all this is that I think this is something which has also been discussed. At very low temperatures, low densities, you, uh, if you start with the so-called from, from the bottom up approach, you almost have no hope of forming curvature no hope of forming larger structures. You, what you would get would be long chains of carbon atoms or carbon-hydrogen bonds. But what if, as also was discussed this morning, I think Jan maybe have mentioned it, suppose you start with some intermediate step. Okay? Suppose you have formed rings. The best ring I can think of is benzene, for instance, and, uh, and, and, and see whether you can also simulate that is, dynamically, okay, the formation, not statically, with the DFT type calculations, although we use DFT as, a, as, 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 a, as, as the intermolecular potential, uh, to calculate the intermolecular potential curve, we're using the same sort of techniques, uh, B3-lip and uh, coupled cluster, uh, uh, you know, single double and, 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 and triple uh, zetas. Um, to, to, to calculate the, to, to sorry, monitor the, the dynamics and calculate the reaction rates. Okay. And, and uh, we use now the, we, st we, st we still use the transition state theory. I'll show you how dynamically you can use transition state theory to calculate reaction rates. But what we are now investigating using um, uh, transition path sampling methods to be able to do it in a, in a different way, without use, resorting to uh, transition state theory. And, and for that, we use quantum MD simulations. The, the, we, we have used TerraChem, which is uh, uh, sort of a favorite uh, software package for, for doing these types of calculations, but it's also very expensive. Uh, it's a package which was uh, developed in Todd Martinez's group at Stanford, but I think they're trying to make a lot of money out of it. 
um, and we're not, we're not that uh, rich. So we're using this, uh, using this package called Quantum Espresso, which is a free package uh, and, and, and is actually quite, quite, quite useful. Uh, and then we use metadynamics method to calculate the free energy. Okay? Uh, I can give you an idea of what metadynamics is, but maybe, maybe in the next uh, snapshot. Okay. Ooh, I don't want to do that. Oh, thank you. Oh, red. Professor Green has a red laser. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let me f first sh show you the dynamics before I sh show you the calculations of the rate. Okay. So, uh, here's uh, we used uh, benzene and, and, and uh, ortho uh, benzene, okay, C6H4. And we put them in sort of perpendicular, uh, I'll show you, oh, here it is. So this is a benzene and in a perpendicular direction to benzene. Okay? And then we simulated it. I don't know if you've seen these sort of things before, but it's really interesting, especially if you show it to children in the schools. They really like it. Okay? So you begin to see uh, some bond breaking over here in a moment, right there, and then they snap it back together. The temperature, oh, I forgot to, I think it's about uh, 1,000 degrees or so, I'll find out. And then, and then you begin to see this uh, ethylene falling off, and, and what you have is naphthalene. Okay. And this can go on, of course, because there, you, you, you can allow it to go. All right. <clears throat> but the, the, the reaction rate, five minutes, good. The reaction rate we wanted to calculate, and this is the potential surface uh, of, the, of, of uh, this reaction, and we wanted to calculate this reaction over here, okay? this R2 reaction, which is from, from here to here. Okay? This one, the intermediate one, to this one. We also have calculated this one too. Using dynamical parameters, okay. So, so these are the free energy surfaces. The, oh, the temperature was two thousand degrees. Sorry, okay. And 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 uh, so this is the the potential well, the, the the main one over here. And these are the other bumps you can see in this uh, in this contour plot. So. So, but of course, this is a multi-dimensional surface, right? We use metadynamics in order to find these, these free energies. Right? And what metadynamics does is sort of, is, it, it, it's known as, is by, by um, sand piling, essentially, potential surfaces. It takes Gaussians and, and drops them on these potential valleys. And you know the size of the Gaussian. It keeps putting them on top of one another until it reaches the top of the potential uh, well. And it knows the number of the Gaussians. There you have the, uh, the free energy. And, and, and when it does that, in the reaction, the system never goes back because it sees a barrier. It can't go back. It keeps going forward. And then it goes and finds another one, another one, another one, another one. Uh, there is a software package, I think, called Plumed for Quantum Espresso, which does these things. And then we calculated some rate constants at 3,000 degrees. This is the rate constant per second. It's about 4.5, 10 to the 13. In this calculation of Comandini in this physical chemistry journal, uh, they had calculated, it's actually they had not calculated, they calculated at 2,000 degrees, but I don't know how my student fitted it because maybe there were some other data points, but I'm not sure. Anyway, it's about 10 to the 13. So there's a factor of hmm, four and a half or so. At 2,000 degrees, we get about seven times 10 to the 10. Uh, and at 300 degrees, we get 1.63 10 to the minus 8. Right? Massive difference in, in the reaction rates. Of course, because we don't have any quantum tunneling yet. And that's what we are also trying to build into the system. If you want to do dynamics at 10 degrees Kelvin, you better have tunneling. Okay. So I think with that, I can stop. But I think this one, I think it's... Uh, 
I think we're making azolene. We're taking, yeah, I think uh, we're separating. We're taking uh, naphthalenes and making uh, azolene from it. If I'm not mistaken, I didn't write it down. But anyway, with that, I think I'll finish. Thank you. Energy services. Uh, I'm going to try a little further back with the. Yeah. So. Um, this is from that paper, physical chemistry, yeah. but yeah. So, so in, 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 uh, in space, if, if ortho benzene came along and bumped into benzene, it, you know, the whole reaction probably would proceed all the way to the right before you'd have any collisions, unless maybe you had infrared emission to cool it down. Right, because you, you'd be stuck at the energy of the first barrier. You mean to go from here directly yeah, to here? Yeah, you go directly, because you, you don't really have any way to cool it down. And I'm wondering, in your simulations, maybe you can simulate that by just turning off the thermostat or something? Just let it be mm -hmm. nice mm -hmm. and energetic. That's a good idea. Yeah, there is a thermostat, so, which I think what brings it down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good point. Someone who knows no astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we place in an astronomical contest what happens to the simulation of clustering when you have 10,000 atoms of hydrogen per carbon atom. Per carbon atom? Ooh. You mean turn this thing? <laughs> there we go. Oh. One CH bond. Uh, no idea. What would happen? I mean, hydrogen, hydrogen is um, it's repulsive. So, I, I need an astronomy question. So, there's, you know how many hydrogens there are. Is that number of hydrogen atoms, or is that total number of hydrogens in, in any molecule? Uh, practically, all hydrogen will be molecular hydrogen. So, it's really H2s. So if you had a whole lot of H2s together, so they would just be repulsive. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's astronomical in the environment, you will have also atomic hydrogen. Like in the, in the environment I showed this morning, you can see yeah. CO2 threat will be purely atomic hydrogen. The photo dissociation regions, uh, also in the atmosphere of the boring star, you have only a fraction of molecular hydrogen. Most hydrogen is in atomic form. So that, the so that would really change the chemistry tremendously, right? Because you'd have all these chemically activated reactions, the H atoms would add to this pH. And give a huge amount of energy to them, and then they would do all kinds of stuff. Uh, because there's no way to lose energy. But, but he wants only one carbon atom. Right? One carbon? One carbon atom. Yeah, I'll probably give you 10 carbon atoms, as long as you put in 10,000. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also a question concerning this simulation when uh, you have uh, uh, allow the system to reach equilibrium, then I assume that you will form only the most stable species in all these complex structures. Yeah, yeah, there are other complexes. Right. That's right. Yeah. No, that's why I can't show you a movie of this, because in a box everything happens. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, um, we have a half hour coffee break coming up, so we'll be back around five o'clock on that clock, four o'clock. Four o'clock. Yeah. Watches. <laughs> <laughs> and let's thank.